Hello. Okay. Hello. Great. <laughs> Thank you all so much for, for coming to this panel. I'm really excited for this. Uh, it should be a very dynamic conversation and debate Hello. about the state of global versus local streaming services and what the competition is like today. Um, so I'm, very briefly, I'm Sherry Hu. I write about music and tech for outlets like Billboard and Forbes. Um, and I'm actually gonna skip intros because they're available in the booklets and online and go right into the conversation. Um, and actually, Tom, I wanted to start with you because a couple years ago you had this uh, prediction or the statement that we would get to a hundred billion dollar music industry in terms of the value of recorded music. And I think a lot of people reacted saying that was really ambitious. And then you also added that we needed a billion paying subscribers to get to that point. So I was wondering if you could maybe provide an update on that prediction, whether we're well on our way there and what role local services might have in that versus the Spotify's Apple Musics of the world. Thanks, yes, so um, that was about four years ago when there were probably only uh, a half a billion uh, smartphone users in the world. Now there's 200 and uh, 2.5 2 million or 2.4 million right now and probably there'll be uh, 2.4 2 billion and there'll probably be 6 billion within the next five years. Um, so when you look at that, you realize that there's a lot of room for growth. Uh, there are 320,500,000 subscribers to music services already, free and paid, not including YouTube. Um, 196 million paid already worldwide. Uh, the paid subscribers are already 8.2% of the wor world smartphone population, and the paid and free are 13.5% are of the entire world of everyone who has a smartphone. So obviously, people can't stream music unless they have a smartphone. Um, so smartphone penetration is a real key to us growing our business, and it's happening anyway. Um, most countries like France and the United States, the UK, have 68% smartphone penetration or greater, but there are a lot of countries that have a 20 to 30 percent uh, smartphone penetration, but they're growing really quickly. Countries like, um, you know, countries in Africa, like Nigeria, huge population, still relatively small pop, um, uh, smartphone penetration. That's a prerequisite for, we can have all the services we want, but if there's no way to deliver the message to the people, it doesn't, nothing changes. So first we need smartphones and um, broadband with um, reasonably priced broad, broadband with connections. All of that infrastructure is being built now, if it's not already built, in these territories. And this is why we see Brazil and, um, and Mexico in the top five of Spotify when they weren't even in the top 25 in the music industry in terms of revenues ever in history before. So um, we're going to see what's happening in Brazil and Mexico happen in Indonesia. We're going to see it happen all around the world. Um, and, and I have some data you know, on that, but uh, it's corroborating data. The other thing that's happening is it takes a while. Sweden has, a, a, obviously they were first, so they, Sweden and Norway have the biggest uh, per capita rev music industry revenue, the biggest uh, percentage uh, of smartphone subscribers uh, in the world. Uh, U.S. was way behind, but we're up to 42% now. The U.K. is at 40%, but most countries are at 20% or less. India is at 0.5% or even less than that. So there has to be uh, a desire for people to have music on their smartphones, and some of that happens when the institutions allow it to happen. Um, other times that has to happen when people learn uh, the value of it, and sometimes that's generational. So for the U.S., for it to go up to 60 or 70 or 80 percent will probably take 10 or 20 years. But, you know, we've gotten to 100 million um, s subscriptions free and paid, music subscriptions in the United States alone. But, you know, but it's a hockey, hockey stick curve. You know, it's really starting to, to break. So everything is working in our favor. More smartphones, more broad bandwidth, and services are exploding and making it easier to, for people to flip the switch and, uh, and have a music anywhere experience, which is I th what I think most people who care about music want. The final question is how many people care about music, but uh, we'll find out that answer in our lifetime, I, I expect. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Yeah, really fascinating. Um, Vanessa, I want to turn my next question to you, sort of building off of this, because you oversee uh, Europe and also the Middle East and Africa in your, in your role. Um, and so I've been hearing this, uh, the same 
sort of pattern all day, especially in the Africa Forum. It's like, oh, smartphone penetration is growing, but it's still really low. Data is still really expensive. So from, from a streaming service perspective, what do you do in that situation? Do you, is it just a matter of waiting? Or like, what steps can you take in the short term to ensure that uh, you're sort of, you know, you're in this market and you're in a strong position from early on? Well, I think, where you, <clears throat> I think the European market is really a diverse one, especially if you take it broader, the EMEA market. You have the markets where you have a high willingness to pay and where you have an inability to pay. We have markets with high smartphone penetration and low smartphone penetration. So um, if you then consider, so okay, how can you grow? I think it's more about finding the relevant service for those um, markets. Some African markets with smartphone might not be the very right thing to start to streaming with. I mean, probably it's rather to go kind of a different path than just smartphone. I mean, who said that streaming services are exclusive to smartphones? I mean, somehow it happened, but uh, this is not per design. So I think also considering a differentiated approach to streaming will help to really get into those markets and be relevant in a way how people consume music today and how they're able to consume it. And also another thing to um, discuss is if you go into those markets, well, whether the subscription as we know it today is the right way to go. Um, I think it's important that you keep the value of music up, but kind of just a monthly subscription for downloading 40 million songs, probably that's not the only path to go in those countries. So I think in those countries, in order to be really successful, I think you should consider kind of some kind of broader platform activities, but also differentiated approach to how you reach your customers. Um, can you elaborate on what you mean by broader platform activities? So just like partnerships with with platforms that have reached but might not have the monetization there? Like, could you like, give more detail on what, what you mean by that? Well, probably the phone is not the only one. I mean, probably deeper integration with car manufacturers or TV manufacturers is probably also a viable path to go. And that might be much more appropriate for some of the countries. Okay, thank you. And uh, so, Jan, I want to uh, direct my next question to you, because um, you're a very newly minted CEO of uh, this streaming service, Cobas, for those who are not aware, it's uh, based in France and it's focused on hi-fi streaming um, and it's expanding into the US and also just launched in Spain a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I would love to hear more from you on, I guess, one, what drew you to Cobas and also what chances you think it has as it expands into the US and also globally um, against the competition, because I think the competition is very tight, at least in the US. Yes, I'm new on this. I'm, I'm, new, I'm new on this side of the fence, but I'm not new in the in the streaming business. Um, to uh, on your last point regarding competition, we don't see uh, we don't see the existing players as as competitors because what we are what we do offer to the market is is unique. Uh, MP3 barely weighs you know 10% of our sales, so we mostly sell through download or through uh, streaming, uh, very high quality music uh, contents, either high res or the CD quality. So um, again, we don't see the other existing players are competitors. However, the way this business uh, 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 spread uh, could, uh, could send on other information. I mean, we, we were talking right before about uh, using the telcos you know, to spread to spread, them, to, to, to spread the business. It's true that so far, mostly thanks to these exclusive deals between the telcos and the streaming, uh, the, way, the, the, the way the business has been evangelized through the, through the, through the public has been, has been a mass market approach because there was one telco and one streamers. I'm very happy to now uh, come offer to the market a very, uh, a very unique approach because I think we can complete the existing offers uh, by adding something which doesn't exist, which is not so far provided by the existing players. And I'm happy that the market is getting more mature because I think that the next step is to have the telcos providing a very large, a very wide uh, offer to their clients the existing one, you know, the, the, the mass market MP3 contents, uh, making happy uh, 
a big big bunch of the of the of the clients, but also a, a more high value offers, being those uh, high quality contents, and um, I think that yeah I think that's the uh, that's the next step uh, of uh, the next step in the business. And um, I'm just curious as to how you're approaching user acquisition because yes you are not competing with the Spotify and Apple Music's of the world in that it's like a very unique offering but. Um, just so say you're about to go into the US, how do you so how are you communicating this offering to users? Um, just saying it's like because I would imagine it's almost like a step, a level above a Spotify or Apple Music saying it's like the next level of streaming. It's like a new, you know, higher quality, but we, your we, we, we may think that we are in more fragile situations because we are we are tiny, we are small compared to those players. So it's hard for us to, uh, to, to acquire additional, additional clients. But again, we know where our clients are. So I think it's easier, from, it's easier to, to, uh, to talk to them, to contact them from a marketing standpoint. Uh, but but we, we still need to make it because again, uh, we, we have been, uh, we, 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 didn't, uh, we didn't communicate so far. So uh, we, are, we are facing a blank sheet of paper, but which, makes the, the adventure very exciting. I'm talking about Cubas, obviously. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, and so I want to open this next question to the entire panel, but also uh, particularly to the labels and also uh, distributors with the Orchard um, in the room. That's us. <laughs> um, so I'm, I would love for you to dive into what value you see in these global services versus local services that um, are much more limited in reach when might have more expertise in a certain market. Um, yeah, so what, what the differentiation you see there is. Okay, um, I'll, I'll take this one. So I think ultimately, um, you know, we're, we're huge fans of competition. I think competition in every industry has proven to drive innovation and deliver great consumer experiences. So um, everyone in the ecosystem in streaming has a role to play in that. The global services are, are doing their thing. Uh, local services um, we have seen in many markets scale um, and they are delivering fantastic music based consumer experiences very targeted at the um, at their own cultural kind of demographic and they have either through uh, business to business relationships that they have in that market they may have a unique position with existing consumer bases and a unique understanding uh, of the consumers in that market and so, so we believe that there's there's going to be a vital role for them to play uh, going forward alongside the global, the global players. Yeah, yeah I, I, I tend to agree, and I always have to do my music ally disclaimer when I see Stu in the front row <laughs> live blogging whatever the fuck I may say. So these are my own <laughs> views, not The Orchard or Sony, and so whatever shit I may say, it's just my thoughts. Um, I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive at this point to have either the, you know, the, the Apple Music's, Amazon, Spotify's of the world, and those taking over, because I also see the, the a huge value in the local services. You know, you could be in the Middle East and have Angami, you know, which, which is really important, because unless you're putting all your metadata in Arabic, you're gonna have a hard time penetrating the market or you, you go to Russia and you have uh, Yandex and, and uh, VK, you know, the, it, it's, it's really important right now to have local players in those markets and they're actually outperforming the big ones right now. And, and maybe that'll be the, 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 the future, which, you know, I kind of like that, what, what John was said, that, you know, we want a lot of players in the market, not just shrink down to one or two. I think that o the music industry keeps doing that and puts us in a quite precarious position when we're beholden to one or two players. Exactly. And I think ju just, just to add, I think one of uh, the things that we've seen is even if there are local services in the market, um, and maybe they were the first to market, first mover advantage, even when global services are, are launching, the local services are still continuing to scale at fantastic rates. So it's, it's, it's really encouraging to see that. And often they just have a different sensibility because they're, they're not kind of bolted in there. It's from culturally straight up in there because, you know, culturally things are, are different, how people perceive things. And I think that's really important. Again, it's, it's, it's not that the big services won't penetrate, but I also think, at least in the short term, all these local services can perform really well. 
Um, Tom, I'm curious if you have anything to add to that with your experience like on the label side. Well, the, that begs the next question is that it, once they achieve scale within their market, aren't they big targets to be bought by one of the bigger ones, you know, who want, yep. who want to have local language versions and they need a team to do that, but they might have um, better R&D because of the scale they have, the, you know, the bigger organizations. So, you know, I, I, it'll be interesting to see how many horses can be in this race uh, ultimately. We're in a transitional period. I think there is a lot of room for local services, um, you know, where there's certain special th differences in those markets that, uh, let's call it a generic service, can't serve. Uh, but at some point, those things should be part of every service. Every service should be able to speak every language to every person. Um, yeah, but I, you know, and again, to you, I, I'm a optimist, and I, I'm also a believer in the hundred billion dollar a year music industry. But I'm also highly aware of this kind of euphoria that we feel around these streaming services, that they're growing, growing, growing. And you look at the last five years, they've grown. And you look at the next five years, and it's growing, growing, growing. But this is the same language as the mid-90s with CDs, you know? 95, oh my God, CDs were at their top. And then 96, and beat it, and 97 higher, and 98 higher, and 99 higher. And I'm worried that we're putting a lot of our bet on this growing forever. And uh, to, to get to our 100 billion penetration, I think it's gonna have to be not just more streaming players, but more other types of services for music if we're gonna really hit that number. I don't think it's purely that the whole world is gonna subscribe to a music service and we're sorted. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think looking back at um, our industry, we know that there's not just one type of music consumer. There's uh, there's, there's a whole raft out there, there's very casual users, um, there's super fans, super engaged customers, and I think that's one of the reasons that we believe competition is, is, is fantastic, because it will help deliver very tailored experiences for the different types of music consumers out there. Um, so I, I don't think it's going to be one size fits all. Um, yeah, that's really fascinating, especially because in earlier panels today, I've heard competition being reframed as fragmentation. Um, and fragmentation not, not being a good thing, at least for, for the music fan. Um, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on this because I think as more local services come up, obviously the market will be even more fragmented. Um, people already, already talking about like how they need to pay for multiple music services and it may not necessarily be the best you know, use of their wallet. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that. The competition versus fragmentation question. I'm not sure the market is really fragmented. If you look, when the, since that business had been invented in the 19th century, we never had, so we, during, during one century, we had thousands of clients. I mean, I'm talking about producers and retailers. So those, uh, those physical retire, retailers were thousands around the world. If you do an 80-20 uh, map of the music market today, there are only a few players compared to, uh, compared to 10 years ago. So I, I, know I think that the market has never been, has never been, has never been uh, like, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, 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 have, we, we are under, under the feeling that it's fragmented, but no, that's the, exactly the opposite. I guess there will be things that fade away. Uh, we'll learn lessons and move forward, but it seems like we're, we're honing the service. There have been a lot of services that were uh, started by cell phone companies that disappeared, uh, like Nokia. You know, there were telcos that were in the business that, that disappeared. You know, um, I think things will come and go, and, and, and we'll uh, iterate on those things. I mean, does anybody know what this is? I was holding it upside down. Probably most people wouldn't know. In five years, nobody will know what this is. This is the first iPod, you know, it doesn't even have like, you can't even plug into it to charge it anymore. It probably was one megabyte or something like that. So, you know, things come and go. There was Walkmans and, you know, but things get better. We're at $18 billion a year now, you know, just about. And we were at 21 billion in 1999 or 2000. I think we'll be, or 22, and I think we'll be past where we were there within a year or two years. And I think, you know, I think that 50 billion for just the recording side is something we'll see in our lifetime. Yeah, but, I, uh, and, and to, your, to your points, I don't think it's fragmented at all. I think it's a, a pretty robust offering. You know, it, it, you know the, 
it wasn't that long ago, certainly when we started in the industry, there was, you know, one consumption model of music, you know, one purchase model. You go into the store and you buy a, a CD. That, that was the music business. Um, now you can have a subscription, you can have ad supported, you can download it, you can get a high res, you can get a CD, vinyl, cassette, you can get it in any possible way. So I think it's a good... And you're a click away. And you don't have to get in a car and go to a store or, or whatever yeah, they, and then deal with finding the record in a store, which was a nightmare. I mean, people don't remember how bad the... We're dealing with user experiences that get better and better, removing clicks between desire and fulfillment. Yeah, Pretty for soon all you'll those just people that love vinyl, because they, they, they didn't live through it and realize how shit it was at the time, you know? <laughs> You've romanticized the past, but trust me, having... 30 million songs a click away is way better than driving to a store and buying something that you've never heard and hope it's good. Yeah, and now with the smart, with the smart speakers that there was a panel on earlier today, you won't even have to click at all. So we're going to be, go we're going to be the zero click, you know, in Just a year. Just think and it plays. Yeah, that's happening. <laughs> Oh my, that could be a whole other like conversation. Yeah, for sure. Um, I want to, so I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about, this is a question for the whole panel, but talking about it, the indie versus major community and what they're looking for and that there are different sort of demands and needs for, in terms of working with global versus local services. Um, John, I was wondering if you could, uh, or I would love to hear for the whole panel, but I'd love to start like, with your thoughts on like what you think the difference might be. I, 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 I don't think we treat them differently in terms of our sort of day-to-day -day business. We, we view them as a, a partner, um, a, a means of getting our music out to, to consumers. So I think how we treat a global and a local streaming service, I don't see any distinction on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of repertoire. Um, Scott or Tom, do you have anything to... Go on, you say something. Yeah. Yes, You're I'd love due to hear for from you something. too, yes. Okay. You... So, I mean... Uh, you know, it's a question of relevance always, right? And I mean, I think in some markets you definitely have kind of a strong pre preference towards the French is very urban uh, from our perspective, for example. And you have in some markets really a strong preference for a certain either style or type of music, whatever. And if that's the case, I think everybody who is really serious about treating the, the customers in a super good way, he would go and try to make sure that uh, the service is as relevant as possible. And this is not just, of course, you can always push whatever you want and try to make it big. But I think it's also to serve kind of what kind of is relevant in a certain market. And especially if there are many, many different markets with different kind of uh, music tastes, whatever, I mean, there will be a lot of differentiation per se in those markets. Um, I'm actually curious, so like for, for Napster and Rhapsody, um, in comparison to the other global services out there, what you think um, you're doing differently, like the company is doing differently compared to the other services in terms of thinking about these markets? Well, it's probably not that much how we think about markets. It's probably more that we don't believe that kind of a smartphone is the only thing that uh, matters. I mean, uh, what have we done in the past? I mean, we gave music away basically for free, either by bundling it to mobile tariffs or by having a freemium subscription, and still we don't have 100% penetration. So somehow, even though it was kind of perceived free, it was not good enough for the people. People were not loving it so much that everybody was using streaming services. So there needs to be something different than just streaming for 9.99 per month music to your smartphone that is more relevant to people. And that is how we like to think about it, to really think, okay, so what are the user scenarios that people care about? If it's not uh, just the smartphone, what else can it be? So w what is it that they care about? If every service, if every streaming service has the same catalog, <coughs> so what is it, you know, what, it, what is it that differentiate, what do they care about? Quality. What are your users? Quality, Quality is one. Definitely. Yeah. And I think uh, Corpus did a great thing here. And I think another great thing that we see in our market is kind of Alexa. I mean, that will open another uh, kind of uh, way to the consumer by simply being able to say, hey, Alexa, play whatever. Um, and also kind of um, not just looking at a smartphone, but having kind of, for example, in-car integrations that are much more rich. I mean, in Germany, 
people are crazy, you know. And in Germany, people have kind of a best possible navigation system on their smartphone. That's why Google Maps, and still they pay thousands of euros for a built-in navigation, a totally redundant thing, but it's so nice and convenient, right? And that's what people love. Not only Germans. <laughs> and that's why people still listen to radio in their car, which is surprising to me. I mean, you know, the numbers on radio in America are ridiculous. You, you know, I don't know anybody that listens, but there must be tons out there. No, I don't believe... Oh, sorry. It, again, my own personal views. I don't believe the radio re research... Because it, 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 they ask these questions, like, have you heard radio this week? Uh, yeah, okay, so that person listened to radio, but ask a teenager... You know, ask a 14-year-old, you know, have you bought a radio? Do you own a radio? Do you, do you care that if you're listening to a song um, and you don't like it, you just have to listen for another three minutes and hope you like the next one? You know, it, they're moving to streaming. I don't care what the figures say. I don't believe it. Because if you ever talk to a teenager, they're not listening to radio. They're on streaming services. Well, radio and is ad-supported streaming in a way. It, it's the original. Yeah, but it, but, but it's not interactive, which is the key thing. Explain that you you can't interact with your music, you can't share things, you can't save things, you can't listen again, you can't skip things. That's that, that makes it a good place to break music. The problem is you can't break music anywhere else because you can't force a listen. Um, yeah. So, and one additional point I wanted to make about the car. Um, I was I. One recent article I'd written was about uh, in-car listening and how Spotify and Pandora were competing. And one quote that someone told me was that people, the car is where actually people spend some of the most money on speakers and like on high quality audio. That's like where a lot of the cost of a car comes from because you're spending all your time listening to, it might not even be music, just audio generally. Um, so there is an opportunity to maybe like cater to, it's like almost these specific spaces for listening are coming up, like different spaces from Alexa in the home to in the car with whatever service will come on to, on, to listening on the go to listening on your TV. There are like all these different you know, yeah, spaces that require different offerings. Yeah. I use public transportation. I don't even own a car. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's another opportunity, I think. To put speakers into the oh, tube. Well, yes. Or <laughs> I live in London and I think that'd be amazing. <laughs> Um, so, looking at, looking at the time, um, we have around 10 minutes left, and I was wondering if anyone in the audience had any questions that they wanted to present to the panel. If not, we No, keep you going. keep asking them. You're doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, if not, I will keep going. Okay. Um, so, I want to... Why don't you ask about that other streaming service that we never talk about? You know which one. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, of course. <laughs> uh, yes. We're never allowed to talk about this, this streaming service, right? Yes. YouTube. I mean, for all the localization, like, it, you have this one in this country and this one in that country and then the global brands, but I can tell you, love them or hate them, YouTube is in every fucking market. Everybody's listening. So, yes, for sure. And, and given that fact and the fact that most people are using YouTube for free, I'm, I'm curious as to what the strategy is on, on the rights holder side. So if, um, especially if, as you're expanding into emerging markets where free is still a dominant form of music consumption or the dominant sort of payment model, if you could call it that. Uh, so is, is the strategy to try to convince more of those people to pay on those services and just work those platforms just like to, to no end or is it to find alternatives that have paid options? This is so for you, John. <laughs> um, so I think we take a territory by territory approach. It really depends on on the market and the propensity for consumers to to pay for for streaming access. Um, there's definitely a role in ad supported services. I think, but they have to be a very clear funnel um, ultimately into a paid experience. Um, so that that's that's really the focus for us. I think in some markets, uh, ad supported plays a much more important role. Um, but getting people into an ad-supported funnel is significant improvement from piracy, which used to be the problem. So, And what do you think about Google, YouTube subscription chances and converting people? Yeah, I mean, it's... it's Sorry, I'm it's, asking that question. No, it's, it's a good it's, question. Um, it's, Just it's, putting them on the spot. No, it's, uh, it's, it's a great question. I mean, I think they, you know, as they, they stated, they have a billion people using YouTube for music. Um, and I think it really is about their ability in their um, 
their ability really to execute upon that and to convert those free users into paid and to market to the free users um, to educate them uh, the benefits of a paid subscription versus their current um, ad supported functionality that they have. Do you want to make a prediction? No. <laughs> as big as possible. <laughs> Um, oh, so another question which I want to direct oh, well, to. Well, I'll, I'll oh. say one thing. Yeah, they, they, they have a lot of credit cards. One of the, one of the critical things is, the, are people credit cards already in there? Like, Apple Music has a lot of credit cards. And pretty much everyone with an iOS device, they have a credit card. So all they have to do is one click to get in. They don't have to input all that stuff. And every click is a detriment to people taking an action. And so Apple is one or two clicks away from getting people to subscribe. In fact, you know, you're seeing the growth in, in America of Apple Music so, so fast, but you're not seeing the usage catch up with. People are subscribing and not listening to it because they don't know they're subscribing. They're looking for their songs that are in iTunes and they can't find them, so they click the button and now they're subscribing, but you know, they don't know what that means. They just were looking for the songs they bought over the last 10 years and they're trying to find them. So, you know, and you look, Spotify's got eight or 10 times as many more music plays, even in the paid version, as, as Apple does. And uh, it doesn't really make sense yet, but that's because it's so easy. They, somebody from uh, YouTube told me that they have hundreds of millions uh, also because of the Android store. They have many, many credit cards there. So conversion will then will be easier than it is for Spotify, because Spotify, you have to go put all your credit card information in, which is a giant hurdle. You know, and and I'm is, sure that's yeah. a, a hurdle for uh, Napster and, and you guys, you know, it's... So if we think of the big four right now, then, then Spotify, Amazon, Apple, Google slash YouTube. Sorry that you're not in the big four. Um, no, but I love, I love Napster. Don't get me wrong. I was just... <laughs> I, I haven't used it yet, but I like, I like high fidelity. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm a big supporter. Um, so, so if we come back in a year or two, how would you line them up? We, who's in the lead? Who's in second? Who's in third? Who's in fourth? You know, right now, it, definitely Google, YouTube, in terms of subscriptions, they're, they're, they're last. They're last. But when will it change? If we come back when, next when year or two PI? years, will they jump up? Do you think they'll be number two, number one? In terms of what? What's number of subscribers. 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 Paying subscribers. Right. And what's about the individual value brought by each subscriber to the service? Meaning what? I mean, you, you got, are you, you dodging the I question? Mean, I mean, you. you <laughs> Sorry. You think like <laughs> you, can a, ask you think no. like everyone is listening to MP3 9.99 per month? No, I'm Don't saying. Don't you think when it, it's going to get more matured, you will have a much wider range of products? Uh, agreed, but in the in the current subscription model, in the I, current I one, in the current one, you, I who agree. Do you, who do you think is going to be the, the future, biggest, and who do you think is going to? Do you think they can all four still be here five I think years that from most now? Most of the people today are driving the same car, and I think it's going to change. Meaning what? I don't know. Meaning car. that you will have people like is it today in the car industry choosing their own car for the price they want, for the value they want, but. Again, this, this, this business ju is just, just born, so uh, we don't see that yet. But when it, get, it will get more matured, I'm pretty sure. And when when is that? When is the maturity? How, how many more years? Because I think it, we it have won't, at least won't happen, five years It won't of happen growth. overnight. It won't happen overnight. But I hope that such players, players such as Cobas, are going to feed what is currently not yet delivered. I mean, one thing that is totally different uh, here in this situation is that typically first the market matures and then the price war starts. Here it was kind of flipped around. So first we gave everything away for free and then we started to mature. So was it somehow flipping the entire what we've learned so far about how industries evolved really totally around? So it's super hard to give you that prediction you're looking for, I wish I could. Uh, but um, I think in the end... But that's the idea of the yeah. prediction. We don't know. We're yeah. just guessing. <laughs> Who do you think is going to be the biggest streaming service next year? Globally, yeah. I think Spotify. I think Apple will be number two still. And I think the battle will be between Amazon and, uh, and uh, Google, um, Google YouTube uh, for mm -hmm. third place. 
And then if one of those successfully gets a foothold in third place, do you think they'll, they'll double down and say, all right, we want to go number one? You know, Amazon's kind of behavior, like, oh, shit, this is going to work. Do you think? I think both of them are going to uh, go for it. You know, we'll have to see what, what the return is, what kind of subs subscription. But they're doing pretty good pick. Both of well, I mean, Amazon is, is picking up subscriptions pretty quickly. I think, uh, you know, YouTube hasn't turned that switch on yet. But we'll see what happens when the merger, after the merger, because they already have quite a few in Google. So that's a pretty good head, head start. We'll have to see how they get over that merger thing. But I think the thing we have to look at is what's the upside potential in the music business? Uh, in the television subscription business in America, 99 million homes, that, there, 99 million TV subscriptions were the peak about three or four years ago, and there were about 112 million um, TV homes in, in America. So that's the number of TV households there are in America. So we reached about 90% um, saturation point. So if we can reach 90% of the unique cell phones in America, because every smartphone, every there's 226 million U.S. cell phone subscriptions. So if we could hit 90% of that, that would be the maximum possibility if you want to look at TV subscriptions, and that would be about, you know, like 180 million subscribers, paid subscribers in America. That, that at, at the current level, which is an 86% smartphone penetration, that's the maximum we could possibly hope for. We're already at, like, 90 million paid, 99 million paid subscriptions. That may be paid in free. Maybe it's like uh, 60 million paid subscriptions in the U.S. alone. So, you know, we're well on our way to achieving that number. But it took the, the uh, uh, cable companies 30 or 40 years to do it. Old people never got cable. They always had rabbit ears on their TV until they died. It's the same thing with my, my dad is never going to be a subscriber or my mom to a music service. If you're over 70, you're probably not going to subscribe to a music service. Unless you so don't know generation. what you pushed with your finger. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> it's just, it's too much of a learn, learning curve, but those people will be replaced by kids who are, and you know, it's going to take 30 years for us to hit that number. So, uh, give it, look at the time. So the last question, or maybe if other people um, have comment, is, is to Jan, um, and it's about uh, streaming services uh, considering an IPO. So Spotify uh, just IPO'd, and it's been doing like surprisingly okay, you know, not, not too much drama. Tencent Music is considering spinning off into its own IPO. Um, Cobuzz, there's also some press around how it was mulling an IPO. Um, and thinking about just, you know, what upside is still left in the music business um, and whether these IPOs will continue to, uh, I guess, reflect an increasing value of music or sort of go down in value. I was wondering as to, well, yeah, Well, the Spotify's IPO was great because it's, it sent the message that you can worth 30 million 30 billions dollars and still losing money. So I like it. No, uh, it's not a joke, um, but seriously, yeah. It's the more we have some, the more we have that kind of positive, uh, positive message, the better is it for the whole industry. So you see that. So it's very encouraging. So, you, so it's almost like a benchmark almost for, or sort of like, oh, that, that is the potential worth of so the streaming service. So 30, million, 30 billion, yes, is yeah. quite a benchmark, yeah? Yeah. We are not very far. We are still very far from that uh, threshold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's all the time that we have, but uh, thank you all so much. This is a really interesting conversation. And thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you.